the other one is very small, so much so that we're not going to consider it. We're not going to consider individuals that come back from the island to the continent. In fact, there are no examples of Galapagos individuals that have gone from the, from the islands to the continent. So it's, the assumption is fair. So we are going to consider the PI is the frequency of allele 1 on the island, and PC is the frequency of allele 1 on the continent. And N is the migration rate, is the proportion of A1 alleles moving to the islands in each generation. So in each generation, there is a number of individuals from the continents that are moving to the islands. And the question is, with that kind of gene flow, can we predict a variation in P? And because P is varying, we are out of hardy weinberg equilibrium. So P prime I is now the new frequency of the allele A1 on the island in the next generation after migration has occurred. So it's a similar setup as a similar nomenclature as I set up before. P is the starting point, P prime is the next generation point. So P prime is P prime I, which is the new frequency on the island is the frequency of allele 1 pi on the island that did not migrate. So because these individuals did not migrate, their rate is 1 minus n. And then we need to add the frequency of allele 1 on the continent, pc, multiplied by the migration rate. So how many of these individuals came into the island? Some individuals did not, did not move, so they stayed on the islands and others came into the island. That's how it's calculated. These guys are called residents. These guys are called immigrants. So that's, that's the, the, the setup of the experiment. So delta pi is the change of frequency on the island from one generation to the next. And delta pi is p prime i minus pi, which is the change in frequency, allelic frequency of A1 on the island. So you can, uh, you can compute that, and it's the migration rate multiplied by the frequency on the continent minus the frequency on the island. OK, this might be difficult to visualize, but if you think about it, imagine one second that the allelic frequency on the continent is exactly the same as on the island. The, two, the populations on the continent and the population on the island are identical. Then if you have migration, it really makes no difference. And sure enough, if it makes no difference, PC and PI are the same. This would be zero, this would be zero, delta PI is zero, the frequency has not changed. Instead, if the frequency is very different in the continent and on the island, this value will be high and the difference will be high. That's sort of to give you maybe a feel for what to expect. Okay, now examples with numbers, it's a lot easier to visualize it when you have numbers. At least for me it's easier. So right now we're gonna start with a situation where there's a big difference in allelic frequency between the continent and the island. So on the continent, A1, the allele A1, is found in 75% of the situations, of the alleles. So 75% of the alleles are allele A1. On the island instead, A1 is only found in 25% of the alleles. So now we have put ourselves in a situation where there's a big difference between the continent and the island because that makes uh, that makes the system work really well and you can understand it really well. Second, we're going to imagine that 10% of the individuals are going to migrate in one generation. That is a huge mass exodus. Trump stays here for a little longer. That's pretty much what we're going to see towards Canada. Or maybe towards Mexico this morning. So um, a lot of people are moving around. 10% of the individuals. So now, what we can do, we are not right, ignored by migration, it doesn't happen very often. 
people definitely want to come back here. And uh, we have looked earlier that the difference in frequency of A1 on the island is going to be the migration rate multiplied by the difference in frequency between the continent and the island. And so if you put numbers to that, it's 0.10, which is the migration rate, and then the difference in uh, allelic frequency between the continent and the, uh, and the island, and this is 0.05, which is actually a really, it's a pretty large number, because this means that here we started with 0.25, there was only 25% of, of uh, allele A1 in the island, but because a lot of A1s came in from the continent, 75% as a frequency, it goes to 0.30. Because there is no migration, this doesn't change. But it's like 0.30. So it has increased by 0.05. It's quite a lot. Go ahead. So it seems like there's like some equations that we have to remember on the like exams. Are you going to provide a formula sheet? Yeah. Okay. Uh, Say the very last Can we have a formula sheet? Is what you said? Yes, sure. Yeah, uh, to me, I think that learning uh, things that you can very quickly get on the internet does not seem like a good use of brain power. And so, um, if it helps you, by all means. I, I kind of like to remember formulas because. I'm weird, but uh, if you don't, absolutely, just write them down. The reason why I'm saying that very easily is because the exam is not based on these kind of things. What I think is more interesting is if you are in a situation like this, you just look at this and you say there is more allele A1 on the continent. There is less on the island. There is a migration that is going from the continent to the island. If I think about it, what is going to happen in the next generation? Is the number, is the PI number going to increase or decrease? And I think that if you think about it, you say, well, I can guess that it's going to increase since more A1s are going to come in. And because my questions are going to be multiple choice, and one will be an outrageous large number, one will be a, a, a lower number, and one will be something reasonable, you can have your formula and you can calculate it so it will make you feel good about the calculation, and it's great, you should. But the reality of it is that if you think about it, my guess is that you can guess the correct answer, and it's an educated guess that comes from reasoning about how, what happens. That's why I think that it's good for you to have the formula on the paper because you won't have to freak out about, oh my god, I'm going to forget this, because it ultimately it doesn't really matter very much. But it's good to, to know this formula, uh, I mean, on paper. So. Uh, yeah. I just have a PC go down and PI go up? Is that what you mean? So, first of all, this is a frequency, and so what has migrated over there is not A1. This is actually really a very interesting question that you're asking. There, there are two parts to, to, to the answer. First one, let's say that you have 100 individuals that migrate. Those 100 individuals will have an allelic frequency of 0.75. So these individuals that migrate will both have A1 and A2, but A2 less frequently. But overall, the frequency of A1 will be higher than 0.30. It's going to be 0.75. And so it's not that you're removing A1s from this one. What you're removing is individuals, because they're migrating, but it's a frequency. It's not just A1s that are migrating. So this is really fundamental. And another thing is, in some situations it changes a little bit, but 
typically, in this kind of model, this population is huge. And so if you are removing 10 individuals out of 100,000, it makes no difference. But even if it did, it doesn't really matter. What you're moving is uh, an allelic frequency, is not a specific allele. Does that answer your question? Will the PIs still increase because you have a higher number? Yeah, like a higher frequency allele? A higher frequency allele, yes. Oh, PC minus. In the, the oh, in the next gen, in the following generation. Yeah. Oh, in the following generation. Oh, yeah, absolutely. Uh, maybe that. Yeah, maybe maybe you just anticipated my next slide. Oh. Maybe that's what it is. So because now the difference now in the following generation, maybe that's what answers your question. In the next generation, because the PI has increased, the difference between PI and PC is not nearly as much, and then. Uh, now, this number, instead of being 0.05, becomes 0.045. This number is decreasing, and in fact, over time, eventually, this number will reach 75, 0.75, and this value will be zero. When you have a lot of gene flow, then eventually, the two numbers become the same. When the two numbers are the same, it's a technical term. Does this answer your question? Oh, I'm sorry, you were... Where have you been? It's called panmixia. Panmixia is when you have so much gene flow that eventually the two frequencies are the same. And so this is what I was saying. That's what happens to humans. Is that we are we are traveling a lot more than we used to, and uh, eventually we have an interbreed, and everybody will be this, will be genetically very very similar, which is wonderful. So socially, but for evolution and biology, it's kind of sad. But and socially, it's wonderful, of course. But like, my grandparents uh, lived in a small village, and they claimed that they had a different dialect than the other village that was literally 300 feet away, because there was just no gene flow whatsoever. And now, now it's different, of course. So, uh, yes, as gene flow happens, the difference in frequency between the two populations gets smaller and smaller. You're absolutely right. I'm sorry, I misunderstood your question. So gene, gene flow can cause rapid evolutionary change, and the long-term outcome will be elimination of genetic differences between populations. And because the frequency of P has changed, we are out of hardy one weg equilibrium, and so, um, uh, that's why there is this no migration clause into keeping uh, into keeping uh, Hardy Weinberg. Now, the question is, why is it that populations are actually different? The reason why populations are different, because gene flow does occur, if you like it or not, gene flow occurs all the time, is because actually natural selection acts to oppose gene flow. Because you can migrate into a population. But then, within that population, you have, you have uh, natural selection that happens, and, and then it, it just uh, keeps uh, specific alleles under, under check. Uh, a classic example of that, that is uh, there are some uh, snakes that are on small islands in uh, Lake Erie, which is uh, one of the great lakes, great uh, uh, American lakes. And when you look at the population in, uh, in, uh, on the mainland, it has a specific allelic frequency that is very, very strong here. And then each island has a very specific frequency for all four alleles. And they can actually calculate how much gene flow there is. And gene flow happens all the time because those snakes raft and uh, go on these islands regularly and there is constant raining of alleles on the different islands, but depending on where they are, the allelic frequency remains very stable because there is natural selection that maintains very specific um, allelic frequencies for all, all four alleles that are in that, uh, in that locus. So, um, so that's how natural populations are maintained and maintained differently than in, in, uh, in the face of gene flow. Yeah. 
you, you, this is super theoretical. If they are exactly counterbalancing exactly each other, you will have the impression that you are under hard number. That's what you mean? Sure. If, I don't know any case, but I assume that it's possible. Um, I mean, yes, theoretically it's possible. I, I don't know of, of any, uh, any case where people have, uh, have ever seen that, but yeah, sure. That's kind of a cool sy system. Okay, we've talked about that. Now we're going to talk about one uh, last aspect, which is the aspect of population size. Population size, uh, you know, the, uh, one of the uh, requirements for hard one with equilibrium is for population to be infinite, the largest possible population size, and which is never achieved. But what is meant by that is that the population needs to be very large. What happens is that uh, when populations are small, you have very weird mathematical effects. So what is interesting about it is that it has nothing to do with biology. It has only to do with math. Yet it's a very, very important factor of evolution. And that's what uh, has been called by Moto Kimura random genetic drift. Uh, what, was, what has been said is that uh, evolution is, ran, is survival of the fittest, and Moto Kimura said that evolution is ran, uh, uh, survival of the luckiest, because we're going to see that in a, in a second. So, there are four assumptions that we have looked at so far. Mating is random with the inbreeding, no selection, that's what we looked at directional selection and balancing selection. No mutation is a very, very small effect, but we've seen it. No migration is what happens in the absence of gene flow. What we're going to look at now is what happens if when there is genetic drift. So, uh, Moto Kimura, who was a person, a mathematician, but he actually personally very much liked orchids, so he was very interested in the genetics of orchids. Um, he uh, came up with a number of extremely cryptic papers, but he has a very, very uh, nice, uh, nicely written book of the neutral theory of evolution. And uh, he said that random changes in the frequencies of neutral alleles from generation to generation are caused by accidents of sampling. Now we are moving into a different type of of uh, uh, genes, so far we have only looked at those genes where alleles have different fitnesses. Now instead, we're going to look at genes where fitness is not at all taken into consideration. So forget about anything about fitness. Now we're going to just look at genes and say, can genes evolve if can allelic frequencies change if their fitness is exactly the same? And the answer is yes in some situations. When you are uh, out of hardy wonder equilibrium because of small population sizes. So this is how it works. We're going to take a bag with some red and white balls and their frequency is going to be 50-50. The reason why I'm picking this is because there is no difference in fitness whatsoever. What you're going to do is that you're going to close your eyes, the bag you can see, and you're just going to grab a, a, a number of things in there, and then randomly picking them. Now, imagine that in the bag you have 40 million balls, and you're going to randomly pick, uh, randomly uh, have that many whites and that many reds. You have, let's say the population is infinite. I take it back. The setup, I just said something that is totally stupid. In the bag, you have an infinite number of balls. Their frequency is 50 50. And out of this bag, you're going to pick 50 million of them, 40 million of them. Now, it seems pretty reasonable that because you are picking 40 million of them, this is about whatever many whites and whatever many reds you're going to get. 
That seems pretty reasonable. And so this is an error in sampling. You don't get exactly the same numbers. And so the difference in frequency between P and Q in the next generation is going to be such. This is a way of showing that the difference in frequency is very, very small. And this is why when you are in an infinite population situation, you actually are in hardy weinberg equilibrium because in hardy weinberg equilibrium, the difference between P is 0.5 and P is 0.500042 is actually negligible. And so this is still considered that you are in hardy weinberg equilibrium. This means that when you have 40 million individuals, random chance of picking one over the other makes no difference. So we are in hardy weinberg equilibrium. Random genetic drift, instead, is a situation where you have very few individuals. So now, imagine that you have the same original bag, but instead you are picking out of that bag only 200 individuals. Now, a reasonable outcome is that you get 94 white and 106 red. That doesn't seem totally far-fetched. Now, if you look at the change in frequency, P is going to be 0.47 and Q is 0.53. This is very much out of hardy weinberg And this has nothing to do with fitness. This is just a mathematical uh, outcome. And so this means that the reason why hardy weinberg one of the assumptions is for population to be infinite, is because when populations are small, you can have errors of sampling, and those errors with given enough time, can actually shift the population from one frequency to another. It only takes a matter of, it's only a matter of time before two populations can, what are called, drift apart. And because they are drifting apart, they, um, they can evolve. Although it has nothing to do with uh, fitness, that's what is really remarkable. Another thing, for those of you that are still paying attention, is that <laughs> When this happens, it's when you actually can go from one peak to another when you are in small rights shifting balance theory. Closing parenthesis for those of you who are not paying attention. Now, some properties of random genetic drift. The magnitude is inversely proportional to effective population size. This means that if you have a very small population, the magnitude of genetic drift is going to be enormous if you have a large population size, not so much. This means, for example, that when humans left, moved, migrated out of Africa, we don't know how many individuals there are, but it's very different if there were 10 individuals or if there were 100 or 1,000 or 10,000 or a million. And so we don't know that number, we can guess it, but when you have a small population, then the effect of error in sampling is enormous. For example, here when I said 200, if I had said 20, very easily you could get 15 and 5. That would be a huge effect. If you take 2,000, well, it's going to be 1,005 and, and 995 or something like that. So the, the effect is, uh, is uh, inversion in inversely proportional to the effective population size. I'll get to effective population size next time. Ultimately, the result, it results in a loss of variation from natural populations. Here we have looked at a situation where you only have two alleles. So it's red and white. OK, that's easy enough. But imagine now a situation you have a bag. And, and instead you have, uh, you know, a lot of different alleles and, and, and they are in, in similar proportions and now you're going to take only few migrants that are going to go here. In this new population you will only have those two types of alleles. You actually have lost some alleles. And so what happens is that you always lose variation when you have a, when you have a migration. Sure enough, in human populations, the more, most diverse
dispersed populations are in Africa, because the individuals that left Africa did not take with them all the alleles. So you have this incredible richness of alleles in Africa that is absolutely not found in, uh, in populations that migrated out of Africa. The probability of fixation of a neutral allele is equal to its frequency in the population. This is kind of a subtle thing that you might intuitively guess or not. This means that if this plus allele is extremely frequent in this population, is 95% in this population, then the chance for this allele to migrate out with a migrating individual is very, very high. If this allele is very rare, the chance for this to be picked by a migrant that moves out of the population is very, very low. And so the probability of fixation of a neutral allele is equal to its frequency in the population. Uh, isolated populations are going to diverge genetically. Uh, this is just one digression that is actually, I think, really interesting. It's kind of a cool mathematical model. When, uh, when humans were, were traveling, there are populations that migrated in various things, in various places, but there is uh, one population that moved to uh, Papua New Guinea, and the population that moved into Papua New Guinea, there are very, very few individuals, and these individuals um, stayed in Papua New Guinea for until now, and now they are genetically very, very similar to each other. Now, if you look at their alleles, the alleles are going to fixate, to, 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 to reach fixation, which is the frequency of one, and the fixation is determined by the population size that moved in. And so, if you have a population of N individuals that migrated into PNG, the time it takes to, f to have a fixation of all the alleles is actually n generations. So if you have only 10 individuals, whatever their genetic background is, 10 individuals that migrate into a place, it only takes 10 generations for all the alleles to be exactly the same. And this is kind of interesting historically how this happens. People bothered it because people were interested in knowing how last names change over time because in many societies only uh, last names of, uh, of the father is kept for the offspring. And so this means that for families that only have girls, the last name is lost. And so you lose over time a number of names and at the end you result, the result is that you only have a single last name. That's what is called a fixation. So there was a nice mathematical model to explain how fixation works, and this is exactly the same for genetics. And this is just due to errors in sorting, and it's not due to, fit, to fitness. And so when you reach fixation, is what is called sorting. Sorting is when all the ideas are fixed. So because sorting is completely random, it is not due to biology, but it's due to math. This is, this is, is completely random. And so if you have this population that is going to be here, and then another population is going to be, let's say, in Australia, or something like that, what is going to be sorted is going to be different. And that's why this, these populations are genetically different. Because what happens to be sorting is just random. Or what I said is true, but it's a little bit of truth. I really appreciate that. Um, it is ex the genetic drift, which is what this is, this is what is called genetic drift, is accentuated when there are population bottlenecks and founder effects. Founder effects is when few individuals from a large population are migrating into a place. That's what is called a founder effect. Another situation that is quite different instead is what is called a bottleneck. A bottleneck is when 
a population crashes, and so they have a large population, and then there is the, the, the plague or something like that. Everybody dies except a few individuals. That's a reduction in population size. That's essentially the same thing, but it's, it's uh, biologically different. And so that's what's called a population bottleneck. I'm going to get to that in a second. I did not develop one thing that you guys didn't ask about, and that it's n e. n is population size. The small e, the sub e here, means effective population size. And so what is the effective population size? The effective population size is in any one generation, n e is roughly the equivalent to the number of breeding individuals in the population. So you can have a very, very large population, but at the genetic level, the only thing that matters is who is getting offsprings. And you would think, well, you know, everybody's getting offsprings. Not really. Uh, for example, in the case of rockfish in the Monterey Bay, you have hundreds of thousands of individuals, but every generation there is only a couple of hundred individuals that are actually successfully producing offspring. And so the population size is one thing, the census population says, but actually the only thing that matters for geneticists is who is producing offspring to the next generation, and it's the effective population size. This is equivalent to what is called a contemporary effective size. Any is uh, strongly influenced also by long-term history. If one, if in one gener in one year you have 100 individuals that reproduce, then the following year you have 1,000, then the next in the, uh, season you have 500, depending on the situation. Uh, these things are going to fluctuate, and calculating the long-term effects is really complicated. It's uh, also called the evolutionary effective size, and the number of things that affect that fluctuation is fluctuation in population size, depending on the availability of resources. Uh, and n is equal to harmonic mean of the actual population number. So let me explain how this works. What you could do is if the population size varies, so this is population size, and this is years, and they reproduce once a year. You can have a population size that varies like this, whatever. And, and so you could do the average. But if you do the average, uh, you are not going to capture the fact that sometimes it goes almost to zero, and sometimes it goes very, very high. And genetically, it's very, very different. So in order to capture the, 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 these kind of variations, it's actually better to do what is called a harmonic mean, which is this formula that you don't need to know by the way. It's 1 over NE is 1 over T the time and multiplied by uh, 1 over N at each, each year. And this actually essentially smoothes these numbers and takes into consideration very low numbers and very large numbers. <laughs> So, for example, if you have three generations where you have 2,000, 30, and 2,000 individuals, so that's very, very big differences, the average would be 1,300, but the harmonic mean is only 87.4. And, and this is really important because for geneticists, the fact that at some point the population was very small is absolutely crucial. We don't really care that at some point the population was huge. The, when at some point the population is very, very small. And if the population is small over many generations, then that becomes quite, quite important. Another thing that uh, happens a lot is the unequal number of males and females. Uh, and this is reproductive ones. Number of males is N, 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 F. So you can actually calculate it with uh, this formula as well. Again, these are formulas that are not, I don't want you to remember them, but just for you to keep in mind that this is the kind of things that really play an important role. In the case of uh, elephant seals, you have one alpha male that uh, is, uh, is uh, fertilizing a lot of different females. So uh, as much as the sex ratio is 50-50, the actual number of 
reproductive males and females is very different. I understand that there are uh, subordinate males that have high efficiency and stuff, but for the most part, the sex ratio at the level of the next generation is very, very skewed. Uh, there are maybe 15 alpha males that control harms of 20 females each. So the census size is, is 315, but the effective size is only 57, because you have these, uh, these huge skews. Uh, and there is also a large variance in reproductive, reproductive success. Uh, Any is reduced because a few, few individuals are actually putting their offspring in the next generation. So, oh, that's interesting. This Dutch doesn't show. Here, any other time, in the case of bottlenecks, it goes back down. It's actually something that looks like this. Doesn't show on this slide. Population bottlenecks is when over time you have this. Now, for example, in the case of uh, elephant seals, elephant seals were killed for their blubber. And at some point, there were only eight elephant seals left on Guadalupe Island, which is an island of Baja California in Mexico. And so the California Academy of Sciences decided to send an expedition there to, take them, to kill them all so they could have the last full skeletons of elephant seals. It's quite a strange concept. But they said, you know, we know that they're going to be killed by, by poachers. We're as well just kill them ourselves and have the skeletons in our collections. So they went there and killed them all. And so then the, the species was extinct. Thankfully, some individuals were actually still out at sea. And years, years later, 30 years later, people uh, actually saw some. And then that's how the population came back. The problem, of course, is that there were so few individuals that now we have huge populations here in Nuevo and Guadalupe and elsewhere, in San Miguel and Piedras Marcas. But uh, all, the, all those individuals are genetically identical. So that's problematic. So genetic bottlenecks refer to severe reduction in effective population size. So we talked about the elephant seals, but the reason why I showed the cheetahs, which is one of my favorite animals, is because cheetahs instead experience a genetic bottleneck, a natural one, where they used to be in Europe, in, uh, especially in Iran, and in uh, Africa, and the entire uh, population of Africa disappeared. They all died uh, of a virus. This is before humans. And, uh, and so they were completely wiped out before humans killed them. And they were all uh, wiped out. And, um, and then, they're actually, all the cheetahs that now we associated with, with Africa, of course, are actually all migrated back in from, uh, from the Middle East. And, and so because of that, there were very few individuals. They moved in, and they, uh, they are genetically all identical. And so they, that's, they experience this natural bottleneck. And there are many, many examples of that. Founder effect is found when a new population is founded by a small number of individuals. It's what I described earlier in the case of, uh, of Papua New Guinea. The consequences is that the new population has only a fraction of the genetic variation that is present in the ancestral population. The initial allele frequencies differ because of chance. It's a random, it's a random sample of the original variation, and then, and then that's what is going to expand in the new population. So, all this is cool, but does it really happen? The answer is yes. And a great example of that is an example of a bird called a silver eye. The silver eye has migrated all over New Zealand, and we know when it migrated, which is very nice, and it migrated from Tasmania. So here, you have the original population here in Tasmania, and then it migrated through southern New Zealand, and then it went like this, and then it went to Norfolk, and to uh, Chatham Island. And now we can see how uh, this is so weird. You have things that disappear as, uh, as I'm showing them. Oh, that's a bummer. I have it on my screen and you don't have it on yours. 
I need a diversity. Let me not do the interpretive dance, and then we'll just draw it. So, what happens is you have, this is a linear frequency, a linear frequency, and this is the level in Tasmania, and then these are the years and the different islands that it migrated to, and it goes like this. And so, in each time it went to another island, what happens is that you have, a, or different places, a group of birds move from one place to another and carry with them a subset of the alleles that were in the previous population. And so the overall allelic richness just keeps going down in very specific stages like this. So it starts off with, with a lot, of course, in the original population, and then just keeps going down like this. That's what this picture is showing. We have a few minutes to summarize a number of, uh, of concepts. Uh, gene flow versus drift. Random drift and gene flow act in opposition to each other. Uh, random drift allows genetic divergence of two populations. Gene flow prevents the divergence. So right now we're just comparing the, the, the strengths of various various concepts. So when MEM is more than one, gene flow overrides drift and prevents divergence. When it's less than one, random drift can lead to genetic divergence. What does this mean? When you have two populations, you actually can model how they are going to diverge. And so you have migration that occurs between them. If migration is huge, as we've said before, the allelic frequencies in the two of them is going to be the same. You're going to have what is called panmixia. Panmixia is obtained when the two populations have very high gene flow and the allelic frequency is the same. When there is a barrier that is created, between that there is no exchange whatsoever. If you give them enough time, and this time is NM, I'm sorry, I'm wrong. If you give them NM generations, uh, I'm sorry, did you back, sorry, N generations, if you have N generations, there is sorting that occurs by drift, and these two populations will be completely different. So if two populations ne are never in contact, and whatever their size is, it doesn't matter, but if you have n individuals, after n generations, the two populations will be different genetically. Now, these are the extremes. Now instead, if you have migration, you can actually estimate how long it's going to take for them to diverge into two different species. And uh, there is a, a, a nice number that is easy to remember. If the migration rate is NEM, NEM is the number of migrants per generation. N is the number of individuals, N is migration rate. NEM is the number of migrants per generation. If you have more than one migrant per generation, then genetically, these two populations will not diverge. They will diverge a little bit, but not too much. If NEM is less than one, it means that less than one migrant per generation moves from one population to another. Then these two populations will diverge into two different species. That's kind of an interesting number because it's easy to remember. This is how many migrants per generation are exchanged between populations. More than one, the populations will not diverge into different species. Less than one, they will diverge into two different species. And Random drift will lead to genetic divergence when NEM is less than one. NEM is number of migrants per generation. And kind of interesting is that it doesn't matter of what N is. Regardless of what N is, because it's a multiplication of N and M, this value can just be one. 
Uh, let me do just the next one. Gene flow and selection. And then we will finish with that. Because that answers your question. Gene flow and selection usually act in opposition. Because selection favors different alleles in different populations. That's due to local adaptation and due to directional selection, for example. Gene flow is that prevents adaptive divergence. So when do you actually see this to happen? If M, which is migration rate, is stronger than select selective pressure, then gene flow overpowers local adaptation and populations cannot locally adapt. Instead, if selection is very strong, then selection can allow local adaptation. So if these two populations are in two very different environments, if there is a lot of gene flow, they will not be able to adapt to the local environment. If there is little migration, then they will be able to adapt to the local environment. I promise that this will be a difficult lecture. I hope that it delivers. <laughs> Thank you, guys. See you on Monday.